you all are starting, so just hold off. Hmm? You can just leave it there, it's fine. All right. good to go. All right. Um, thank you all for coming today to uh, be introduced to our amazing fall 2023 artists in residence. Uh, the McCall Center is so important because it allows artists like these to have a space to make the work that they want to work or they want to make that's important to them and also to collaborate with community, um, which is you all. So thank you for donating your time um, today. Um, I'm going to introduce each of these artists individually and let them speak about their history, their own practice, the work that they're making now, and what they want to do in the future. And after that, we'll go over a couple questions exploring how their work speaks um, to each other and the common themes within their practices. That's all um, in the exhibition right now. Coming together is the beginning. So if you haven't seen it yet, please come back. Um, Friday, Saturday, or Sunday, and check out their incredible work. So I'm going to first introduce um, Dennis Rodriguez and Leonardo Ramor. They are collectively known as Rodriguez Ramor, right here. And they are creative partners who are artists, curators, and researchers. And they explore boundaries and dualities imposed by society and humanity. They're focused on material issues in the relationships between art and nature. They actually have a video that you see right here when you come in, and a community project already in the works. Uh, they founded Morante Zixic in Bahia, Brazil, promoting research residencies in various areas while safeguarding cultural heritage. And I will let them speak for themselves. Hi. Hi. Uh, everybody. Do I speak loud? You might have to project a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I think, about, well, I'm Denis Rodriguez, and together with Leonardo Ramor, we are the Brazilian duo, Rodriguez Ramor. We have been working together since 2013. But before uh, showing a slide, uh, for our first slide, I want to invite everybody to come close and we make a, you know, like a circle <laughs> like we do in Brazil, you know? Yeah, let's move to our chairs up. That's fun. Yeah. There's not pretty many of us, so. So we live in a national park called uh, Chapada da Mantina, uh, in a really small community of 400 people. Uh, this community is called uh, Igatu. Uh, so, Igatu is a true living museum of the diamond uh, mining history in Brazil. Uh, this place, 100 years ago, uh, was the most important uh, diamond mining place in Brazil. So what catches the eye is the local architecture where the builders, uh, they used to build with the remnants of the diamond mining, the rocks that they extract for the mining. And also they anchor these uh, rocks on the tectonic structures of uh, our region. In this place, we decide to create a residency program and a project that we call Mirante Chique-Chique. Uh, Mirante Chique-Chique is, it's a place that encourages and facilitates research in the national park. We promote multidisciplinary residencies geared towards visual artists, creators, writers, architects, uh, musicians, scholars. So this is a participatory piece uh, that we showed recently in our last group show in Brazil. Uh, it's called Japamala. Uh, in recent years, we have been working a lot with clay, but also with ceramic, and we do lots of installations. Uh, this participatory installation responds to a resi residency that we join uh, 
in 2021 in a Buddhist temple. Uh, and this temple, they run a residency as well. So in that temple, they have the largest uh, Buddha in America. So we decided to create the longest Japa Mala for this Buddha. Uh, we really like to create works that ask people participation. And the idea of the Japa Mala is that it will, ha it will turn 108 turns around itself. Um, and yeah, we didn't finish yet, still continue. And then I would like to talk about our last installation that was called Dagmar. Uh, it was a video installation that combines film, ceramics, sound, um, and it was commissioned for the Panorama of Brazilian Art, which is the longest running group show in Brazil, after São Paulo Biennial. Uh, this was a relational, immersive installation that invited the, peop the visitors to come closer to Dagmar's life story. Dagmar was an artist, ceramist, born in Bahia, and she represents the continuation of the traditional pottery in our country. And she used it to produce manually using coil building, the largest vessels in Brazil, where she used to wrote her own life story. So we did a documentary, but we also inspired by this because Dagmar said that she wrote her own story on this pot because if it broke and someone find a piece, it will learn something about her story. So we split the video in eight monitors. So there was like one hour of video and people could walk and sit on ceramics on her uh, and see her actually like seeing the video, the pots being made, and then the actual object. Um, then, inspired by Dagmar, and after this experience, uh, learning from her, we, we did this series that was called Pottery Poems. Uh, this was made uh, during our residency at the Bemis uh, in Omaha, Nebraska. And it was a collaboration with other two writers that also live in Nigatu in Chapada Diamantina, uh, Adila Madansa and Ariramba. So uh, we start sharing some videos, very small and silly videos about nature, some magical things that we found during our walks. And we start sending to them and they were responding with poems. Uh, so we, we wrote these poems on the, on the pots and inside the pot there was a projector that was projecting these, these videos on the, on the wall. Another work that we would like to bring that we may, we may continue work on, the, on this project here at mm -hmm. McCall is this series of work called um, The Eternal Present. Uh, this is a long-term research that we've been doing because in our town and Chapada Diamantina region there is a lot of cave paintings. Uh, most of them still not mapped by go the government. So we start uh, visiting these places and taking photos, creating this archive and then uh, bring into our studio, start thinking and doing some work. This was the first time we showed this research. We, we just printed the photos, but then like the photography was not enough, so we start folding and, uh, and crumbling the paper to bring this bringing the power of the site and the place uh, because for us like the paintings and the, the places, the stones, they are inseparable. So from this research with, with the game paintings we continue doing and we have a really big archive 
uh, full of images of cave paintings uh, of our surroundings. And in one moment, we decided to, to bring the cave paint to three-dimensional space uh, using clay, but using as well uh, some really light metals. In this case, we work a lot with natural finishings. We work a lot with bee wax. Uh, we tried some old techniques uh, uh, of natural enamels as well, like using uh, a combination of matte and, and uh, sh um, gloss uh, enamel, natural enamel. And in this work, we are in this work, we are trying to create a pre-Columbian imaginary. Uh, this work is our way to question why European imaginary still, still prevails in the art world. Uh, we like to imagine what would be a genuine American imaginary, what would be an American visual lexicon. So all these figures come from different sites that we visit recently, and we want to continue doing this uh, ceramic, this practice of ceramic here in Macau. And we, we like to, to imagine uh, how would be the art world if the colonizer, instead of killing and imposing their culture and religion, uh, how would we, uh, how would we how would be our world if, we, if the colonizer could uh, have decided to live and learn from these native cultures? Thank you all so much. I'll take this in the clicker. Wow. So next up, we have Sarah Elizabeth Cornejo, who goes by S.E. <laughs> and S.E is a Peruvian American artist based in Memphis, Tennessee. She utilizes sculpture, installation, textiles, and drawing to explore hybridity and humanity, humanity's impact on the environment. She challenges traditional binary thinking and uses natural materials to challenge human hierarchy. Um, SE graduated from Davidson College and is currently teaching while in residence. Uh, she actually has an installation here at the McCall in a back gallery room, and definitely come and check that out. Thank you. And thank you for that thoughtful insight into your practice. That was beautiful. Um, so I'm S.E., and um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about the work that I've been working on maybe the last two years, because it's the work that I'm going to focus on while I'm here at McCall. Um, so I'm really interested in doing a lot of research right now into pre-Columbian serpent mythologies in Latin America, and particularly the ones coming out of Peru, since my family is from Peru. Um, and I'm interested in kind of the way that they are very different from these sort of Catholic ideologies of the serpent being something evil, or in the United States, the serpent becoming this sort of like symbol of kind of right-wing extremism. Um, so in Latin America, actually in a lot of the mythologies of the world, um, there's this idea that the serpent is this kind of like writhing central force of the earth and it's like moving the tectonic plates and it's like the cause of change in our world and um, that uh, portals kind of open up to our reality. That's like the serpent mouth. It's like this toothy vagina from which we come and to which we return. Um, and I'm particularly interested in this um, mythology of the Amaru, which is in Peru, um, which is this like puma-winged feathered serpent deity that lives in deep water or deep earth, and they can transgress this boundary between our reality and their um, realm. And um, they're not really, they're not interested in humanity, they're not out to get humanity, they're not out to save humanity. They're in charge of um, earthly equilibrium, so they bring rain or earthquakes, um, just whatever's needed to right the balance. Um, and being uh, proven on one side, my mother is from South Carolina, and um, I grew up with my grandfather who was a forester, so we had a lot of um, 
snakes around. <laughs> and I am really interested in them as a personal symbol of hybridity, the forked tongue and the bilateral movement, like growing up in a dual language and a dual culture and this um, kind of feeling of duality, not belonging in one place or another, but occupying this like very much in the middle space. Um, so I wanted to make this series for um, a lot of reasons, but a lot of the materials that go into it are collected and brought to me from my community. So there are ways that I um, kind of move within my community. I take walks and I pick up things as I walk and then um, get to know my neighbors that way. And they start to like leave offerings and gifts for me to kind of um, put into my work. And it's, um, I kind of imagine these Amara are coming out of this center of the earth kind of encrusted in everything that we would bury. So there are these kind of um, dead materials um, there's pig hair, and there's um, bullet casings that have been found, there's old nails that I've pulled out of wood from houses that are being flipped um, in Memphis, Tennessee, which is where I live. And for me, all those materials then come and bring that content to the work. And so sourcing materials is really um, important for me. But um, alongside the series, I'm working on these sort of portals and other installations that are um, kind of existing alongside this room and are discussing sort of the, um, at least in the United States, like our kind of trajectory of climate um, disaster and social violence kind of being irrevocably intertwined. So I'm playing with sort of how do we come out of this realm and up into another. And so for, the, for this one, I'm doing it in a couple different ways and that's kind of what I'm trying to find my footing in while I'm here. Here I'm using a mirror, um, and I'm, cover I'm creating this sort of little creature that might exist at the center of the earth, but with cicada wings. And for me, cicadas, it's another one of those creatures that addresses that like spiritual realm above realm, like one other realm in our current reality. Like they're underground for 17 years, and then they're above ground for two weeks in a different body. Or like dragonflies are in the water for something like five years, and they're carnivorous, I think they eat fish or something. And then they come out and they're the dragonflies that we're aware of. And so there's this mirrored um, double image of this creature. Um, and then it kind of comes out into these pools um, that are sort of this hybridity of um, artificial and natural materials kind of coming together. And with this, I'm kind of thinking about, again, where materials are sourced, of course, but I was doing a lot of research into instances where places that have been disturbed by human presence are then responding to it and recovering from it, and kind of posing this um, question, maybe for the viewer, but also for myself, of are humans capable of doing something similar? Um, and so these pools are then, these, this installation exists um, in the same space right now, but has existed in the same place before. So it's kind of like from the mirror, we maybe come up into this thing. Um, but, you know, this is collected material, again, from just taking walks in my city. It's, you know, shattered side mirror, um, citrine rock, um, bricks. There's an iPhone in there. <laughs> you know, there's all sorts of stuff coming together to sort of create this quiet commons where um, maybe we'll start to think about um, collective action or maybe we'll keep doing what we're doing and maybe we'll cease to exist and sort of having um, um, a conversation with the materials themselves. And some of those portals are taking the form of um, uh, tapestries kind of in here, but uh, that'll take a long time to talk about, so I'm skipping that one. <laughs> um, and then finally, this is the last thing we'll talk about. Um, kind of thinking about those portals in less um, sort of phenomenal or hypothetical realms and kind of bringing them more to also like our current, the current kind of urban environment that I live in. Um, so this is hypothetically a sinkhole, but it's built on a, or built based on a sinkhole in my neighborhood. Um, and it's been there for years. We've all just kind of like navigate around it. And then once I made this work, actually, they came and fixed it. Um, so I don't know how word got out, but it did. Um, but when I first encountered the sinkhole, I was really struck by the idea that we build these cities in the US that are just so much concrete and steel, and this idea that um, of like human supremacy and we will exist forever, and then the earth can just suck it right back down into this like center space, perhaps. And I thought that, like, um, 
like little shiver of fear I felt as I looked into it was an interesting metaphor then for the same kind of illusions of social hierarchy we have that are based on violence and based on oppression and are equally false. Um, and kind of thinking like, will we you know, look into the sinkhole or are we gonna walk away and do this some sort of ignorance is bliss. Um, and so I wanted, um, this was a public sculpture and public sculptures often, you know, people are gonna take photos with them, they're gonna climb on them, they're gonna post them on Instagram or something. And I knew that would happen and so I wanted to be kind of intentional in creating like a divide between what's in person and what's online. And so the inside is coated in this reflective material that you know, they put down on airstrips so that when airplanes are landing, the light bounces back. And so if you take a photo with the flash on, it lights up like this. But I'm actually standing in the dark here. I'm not in this place. This is just what the photo looks like. And so I wanted it to be this really intimate, large thing that people can one at a time walk into this entirely dark room and kind of come to terms with whatever that feels like for them, and it's a really personal and individual experience. And then whatever is online exists in that same fraught realm that I think online can be. Um, that all these moments where people are posting these kind of like fake environments are actually people alone in the dark. Um, so I wanted what exists in person to be one thing and what online is to another. Um, and so, you know, for the rest of my time at McCall, I want to um, maybe bridge this gap between these two series a little more, um, not necessarily effectively, but um, more uh, detailed, perhaps. Um, so yeah, that's what I have. Thank you. Thank you, Essie, for that fascinating look into your work. And handing it off to May Parlar. <clears throat> and May is a lens-based, multidisciplinary artist born in Istanbul, Turkey. She embraces a diverse worldview due to a nomadic upbringing and explores themes of belonging, identity, memory, and the human condition in her art. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I, I love your work and I'm particularly interested because I have a severe snake phobia. <laughs> so <laughs> it, it, it took me some time to be able to check out her work, but I'm, I, I love it now. Um, so I'm May Parlar. I, um, as uh, Bethany mentioned, I was born in Istanbul and I was raised uh, between multiple countries, mainly, well, I, I grew up in Istanbul until I was a teenager and then I started going uh, back and forth between Istanbul and New York um, and then lived in several different cities and countries and at the moment I live between uh, Berlin, Germany, New York and Ankara, Turkey and my practice is uh, very much um, shaped and affected by this uh, nomadic existence, by this movement. And um, I work a lot on um, the issues, um, sort of like, um, exist let, let, let's say like uh, spans from a very selfish, self-indulgent existential uh, issues that concern uh, any human being uh, to the it spans to the um, social art practice where uh, my concern is more about um, social inequalities and injustices and disparities and uh, things happening to all of us individually and collectively but this uh, particular um, project is called collective solitude um, this is a series of um, performance-based imagery. There are still images and, and moving images, videos, um, that I shot all over the world, many places that I've, I've lived in in the past uh, several years. And um, some of them are very spontaneously uh, made. Some of them were. Um, planned before and um, almost all of them were um, quite like meditative and personal processes for me like this is in, in the salt lake uh, in Turkey and the central Anatolia and I have visited there many 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 times it's uh, one of my favorite places 
and um, it used to be a lake. Now it's just salt flats, but um, you uh, it's it's dry most of the year. It's entirely dry now. Uh, it used to have a flamingo population that it doesn't have anymore. Um, also, the the salt mines that were there at the time were um, employing many of the locals. That also doesn't happen. Um, there's a lot of um, like um, corruption in nature happening on the la landscape happening there. And I traveled there a lot to uh, do photography and, and video. And generally, like, um, sometimes put myself in, in these, like, uh, funny positions that this was about. A creation myth uh, at the moment I was concerned very much on um, gender and how women uh, are uh, created in religious stories. And I decided to form my own and said, I just, I was just a blob falling out of the sky and then my legs came out and then my, my arms came out. And this was, I think, two years ago in Italy. Uh, again, it was, a, it was a windy day. This was sort of a spontaneous uh, thing. I was with a friend, I did uh, fabric is something that I am um, obsessed with and I used a lot in, in my photography. I started using these floating fabrics when I was um, working on a project called Once I Fell in Time. It was very much on time and memory and time perception. Um, and, um, so, and I continued using these fabric and fr you know, freezing them up in the air and sometimes using in, in videos also. Um, like this is one from several years ago. This is again me. This, this was a piece I was commissioned to make in, uh, on the coast of uh, Turkey. I just like spent a few days in this uh, space and uh, sitting at, at this chess table and then decided to uh, make the, the, this uh, piece playing chess with myself. This is uh, one of the images I made at um, my residency in Barcelona. Uh, I think this was in 2018, uh, maybe. That um, I was very much concerned at that period about um, being um, one, this idea of being one or the other, uh, it's like a uh, binary idea and also like being part of the, part of the nature or being nature or part of the landscape or being the landscape and uh, especially in like urban environments and there were a lot of uh, abandoned uh, places in Barcelona. Um, just um, you know, some uh, greenery and some junk happens to be all around, and I use these uh, places to make a series of uh, still and moving images, and this is this is one of them. Um, this is again on the salt salt lake. Um, I am also pretty much obsessed with paper boats. <laughs> you can see in the series a, a lot of them. Uh, I've been obsessed with them since I was a child. I've always like wanted to. Uh, I was like drawing and making paper boats, and I was imagining hopping on them, and then they become real, and then I go off uh, somewhere. Um, and this was also sort of very much related to this uh, fear of where where can we go? You know, there's. We live in this like finite world, and there's not you know where, where, where to go anymore. There's nothing like one this, once this uh, lake is dry, one this, uh, once this like earth is uh, not uh, uh, livable anymore. Where to go? It's just we only have paper boats. They don't even go anywhere. Um, and this is uh, the the first uh, my first attempt to. Uh, uh, 
be a paper boat and go off. This is a United in, in Barcelona. Uh, there's a video version up uh, on the second floor. Uh, this was a vi video performance, and then I made uh, the image version of it as well. Uh, the video performance of upstairs, you see the short version and the long version. I walk, uh, I, I made this uh, boat, and I walk all, all over uh, the streets of Barcelona, and then I find uh, the coast, and then I go in and swim off, and then swim back uh, to the same shore and, and, and come out. And there's a funny story attached to, uh, to this. We were talking about this. Um, there was a lovely uh, friend assisting me uh, doing this. He had the camera on a tripod. And this was a very cold day. And I am generally someone who gets extremely cold for me, and I'm terribly Mediterranean, and knowingly that if, if, if it's not 40 degrees Celsius out there, uh, like, I don't know, 150 or something, <laughs> uh, I wouldn't go in the water. Um, but in, in, in for the sake of art, I, <laughs> I had to, and I was very much in the zone, and I went into the water, it was freezing, and then I started swimming, and it was so meditating. I, I got in the zone, Boom, I totally forgot. I was just like swimming and swimming, swimming. And then I realized, wait, I'm actually doing something here. Let's <laughs> go back and I walk back out. And then it was all applause, hey, wonderful. And then a few days later, I was going through the footage and I hear in the middle uh, my friend is frantically uh, screaming, oh my god, oh my god, I can't see her, oh my god, something happened, I can't see her, where is her, should I call someone, she, he's talking to himself, and it goes like for, uh, for 20 minutes or so, until he says, oh, I think I see her, I think that's her, yes, okay, I see the world <laughs> picture, and of course my first concern was, Oh, I'm so glad he did not stop, <laughs> stop shooting <laughs> and go like try to find someone. Uh, so and, and afterwards, after I dry out, I changed and I said, OK, I, I also want to make a photo of it. So let's just let me swim again. And I made this fo uh, photo. So all these um, photographs are, uh, th this is in Berlin. This is also from two years ago. Um, sort of inspired by the storks <laughs> migrating around. And this is in Hamburg uh, several years ago. Um, this, is, uh, this was part of something uh, I was working on, uh, the suburban, suburban life. Um, I am also obsessed with balloons, basically. Balloons, paper boats, uh, floating fabrics. I would say colorful tights too, maybe. <laughs> this is um, called Theater of Consciousness. This is uh, again a few years ago. This was in Montenegro. Um, I spent many um, weeks looking at this view and getting mesmerized, and then I watched. Um, hundreds of people looking at this view and saying, um, just people, visitors, uh, tourists, oh, it's such a beautiful view, I could just look at it forever and then taking a snap and go away. Uh, I don't think I've seen any of them looking at it more than maybe a minute. But I've heard so many times, it's gorgeous, one could look at it forever. But we never look at things forever, not even five minutes anymore. Uh, the, the way that, uh, I don't know, maybe we, we don't even watch movies anymore. We can't even have that. Um, so this is called theater of consciousness because I wanted to just like watch that beautiful thing as if it's, it's, I was in, in a theater. And uh, uh, again, this. Uh, made me go in the water <laughs> many, many, many times with my chair also. Um, yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, May.
So we have another collaboration here um, to end our talks. And this is Monique Luck, um, who has the mic right now, and Jackie Shelton Green. Monique Luck is an award-winning international artist and muralist. She is collaborating right now with Jackie, the North Carolina Poet Laureate, on the Communion of White Dresses, an interactive installation reimagining tradition in the black female body politic. Her work has been exhibited across the United States, including at museums and galleries all over. This is Monique's second residency in the McCall Center, so we're welcoming her back. I'm happy to have her. And before you go into your work, um, actually, you know what? I'll have you go through your work, and then when we get to Jackie's, I'll introduce Jackie separately. Okay, right. thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for having me. Um, I really want to get into one of your boats, May, and, and say <laughs> okay, so. Thank you so much, everyone. I'm, it's an honor to be here. I brought a few um, pieces of work just to kind of talk a little bit about my practice and process. I'm really inspired by stories. Um, every um, piece that you see is inspired um, by someone I know. And then typically when you look closely at the work that I do, I use lots of fragments of paper, um, things that I find. I will hide little words in there that kind of helps to tell the story. Um, this particular piece is called Harmony. And the, uh, the word Harmony is hidden in the piece. And also her name is Harmony. That was my model. And she's, um, she's somebody who just really, really inspired me. And I, I felt like at the time when I created it, we needed more harmony, you know? And so it just, it's just her spirit and then her name and then the idea of just finding this peace and harmony is what we, we really need. And so when you look closely at the piece, you're gonna see little words and things that kind of lend to that. So I wanted to find like a sense of serenity um, with this particular work. <clears throat> this is a work I, I brought. You can't really tell here in the image, but um, this was inspired by hundreds of messages and notes um, that I did during a, uh, a project called the Evocation Project. And it was based on the idea and the concept of loss and grief and what loss maybe represents to, to, to people. And it's not necessarily always like losing someone. It could be loss of a country. It could be loss of a home. It could be um, loss of a, a sense of identity. So when you look very closely at this particular work, there are lots of little messages that people left me notes and so incorporated in the piece are their stories so when I say there's hundreds I there's a lot of people who I didn't even get to meet but they would leave me these messages anonymously and as I went through and I was reading them it was really it was really a process because you know when you're reading about loss or reading about grief it can it can be heavy but I wanted to kind of like express it in a, a beautiful way where we don't have to let it hold us down but what can we learn from it and what are those memories and so that's really what this particular piece is about and and the title is called <coughs> excuse me it was the wind it was the way you made me feel back then and even now and i just thought that was so beautiful and that was one of the messages that someone left me so i don't even know they don't even realize that they inspire this piece and so I wanted it to be like yes we're on the wind and we're floating and that's what this particular piece is about. Um, I wanted to bring this piece in because I do a lot of public artwork and I feel like public artwork is really really important um, especially for those who may not get to a gallery um, to be able to interact in a community and so this particular piece is upcoming. Um, it's going to be installed in Druid Hills here locally in Charlotte. Um, fingers crossed, very soon. <laughs> and we've been working on it for a little while. But um, this piece will be a porcelain tile mural. And throughout the, throughout the work, you're going to see again all these little notes and images and um, things that came from the community engagement. So there's special special things there's one one of the things that someone brought was like a rock and i was like 
this is amazing. So how am I going to get this rock in here? So of course, you know, I photographed the images, um, the, the objects that they bring, but it was just so amazing. He says, this rock means the community. This means the earth to me, and I just really want to see this rock in, in this piece. And I said, don't worry, we got you. So you got to find it one day. You got to find the rock. But um, just, it's just the, the community is what really inspires me. And I think that's why I'm so passionate about public artwork. Um, this is a piece, it's called Momentum. And I kind of threw this one in here because it was like a pivotal piece for me, um, just kind of, and also relating to what Jackie and I are gonna be doing. It's just as a female, as a woman, um, finding identity and just breaking free from old boundaries and moving forward and just allowing yourself to express who you are and what does that actually mean. And so for me, this piece momentum is just, it's a personal favorite. And so that's why I brought this one in for today. And then the final, the final image, um, this is another public art piece locally here in Charlotte. And because I love the community engagement so much and lo really looking forward to what we will do together here, um, this is a piece that I worked with children and adults. And on two separate sessions, and the energy was just amazing from both. And just to see the expressions and the joy that the children brought that represent the future, and then seeing what happened in the past, um, it was just such a, a wonderful pivotal, pivotal, excuse me, pivotal moment um, for me, connecting with the community. And it was several years ago, but I, it's still one of my favorite projects ever. And um, those, those, one of the things I love the most is if you get close to it, you're going to see where I had all the participants write their names. So everyone has like almost like they signed the artwork themselves too, so that they were part of it because I wouldn't have been able to create it without them. And it was a very, a very special piece. So I'm really grateful to be here again, and I'm, I'm excited and honored to be working with Jackie Salton Green, and um, I'm going to turn it over to her because she can speak much more clearly and better than I can. So. <laughs> Thank you so much for that, Monique. Um, lastly, but not leastly, uh, Jackie Shelton Green is the ninth Poet Laureate of North Carolina, the first African American and third woman to hold the position. She's teaming up, as I said earlier, with Monique Luck to create work around her poem, The Communion of White Dresses, which I think she might be gracing us with a reading of. And uh, she is an accomplished poet and educator and recognized for her contributions to literature and the arts. Thank you. First of all, I just want to just bear witness to how honored I am to, to be sitting amongst you. Um, and I believe in the power of community building and I believe that wherever we gather intentionally or not intentionally, we are creating community in some kind of way. So just organically, thank you. Thank you for, thank you for this energy. Thank you for this space. Thank you um, for allowing some of us who believe in the power of truth telling to have a space to exercise that, that way through our art. So growing up in the rural South, I have these two pieces up. Um, growing up in the rural South, I have always been fascinated with the connections and disconnections of collective uh, memory, collective dismemory, uh, the things that we remember and the things that we remember to remember not to remember. Uh, I think uh, our, our Southern culture has taught us a lot about uh, how we collect memory as well. So as a documentary poet, I have um, spent many, many years thinking about the fixed names and territories uh, that I've wanted to disrupt and that I've wanted to go inside of those stories. And the white dress is one of those. And, and I don't want to, we're, we're so excited about the white dress that I don't want to just jump into it but talk more about uh, my trajectory of being in the space. So these two pieces, um, the, older pe the piece on, on your, to the left, the older woman, is actually, this woman did not know it, but she was painting my mother. A um, group of artists were asked to give in a collection of my poetry, a group of Orange County, the Orange County Artists Guild, and for a year they were to select pieces of poems or entire bodies of work that they wanted to respond to through art. So some made jewelry, some were sculptures, 
And my mom had just died in December, and this woman uh, created this piece. And when we all got it, the family was like, who painted, who painted Grandma? Who, who painted Mama? Like, did you give her a picture? Um, so it was, it was very interesting that she really was channeling uh, my mom. I believe in those portals. I believe that, that they're always opening and they're available to us. Um, so this other picture over here, these three little girls, um, really exemplifies kind of the whispering in the ear of growing up in a, in a South where there were lots of secrets. And secrets that were disruptive, secrets that uh, were informational. And it brings me to this question of the sense of what is a dangerous way of knowing? What's a sensual way of knowing? Uh, how many ways do we learn how to know uh, with these three little girls? And that's, that's going to largely inform the white dresses piece, especially thinking about how I use primary and secondary sources as a documentary poet to deconstruct, uh, disconfigure, uh, many of the social commentaries about racism, around racism, sexism, classism, and right now, more important to me, ageism. Um, and thinking about just the southern uh, ecosystems around commerce. We've talked about this earlier. Uh, the ecosystems around, around commerce and be that confederate commerce or be that um, ancestral commerce. So there's a, actually ancestral money uh, as a response to the Confederate money that was very much visible in our culture. So let's get to white dresses. Oops, I'm going the wrong way. So this is a cotton field uh, near my home. Uh, the photograph next to it is my great grandfather, Caswell Holt, who was the first African American uh, sheriff after Reconstruction in Alamance County. And the historical archival story is, is that he and his brother, Samuel Hote, arrested a white woman for public drunkenness downtown Burlington, North Carolina. That night, they were dragged out of their homes. Uh, Sam was lynched. Caswell survived that, that lynching. And we know he survived because there's archival record that in the 1800s, he appeared in Washington, DC at an anti-Klan activity uh, rally or um, you know, speaking, whatever you do, hearing, hearing. So how do, I, can, how, do, what, how do these two slides configure into the white dress? That cotton, they belong to the Hote Plantation. The Hote Plantation in Alamance County are uh, revered for their introduction of, of cotton, of cotton fabric to North Carolina. So when you think about Burlington industry, Industries, they were the forerunners. Of course, their first tiers of employment, of labor, were their enslaved people. Uh, and then the factories became lily white, and those factories now have been be, are very much integrated. But I have always had this obsession with fabrics and textiles, and that white dress for me, I've always lived in kind of a liminal space with the white dress. Um, the white dress as a secret, the white dress itself uh, as a communal wail. And how does the white dress become a quilt or a landscape? Uh, how does the material become a storytelling device? Um, so everything from my daughter's white christening dress to the white linen shroud that she's buried in. How do we approach this territory of whiteness? So the question that I have for myself inside of collaboration is what are the poetic exercises inside of language when it becomes something else, when it becomes a brush stroke for Monique or a musical score for the Cincinnati Orchestra? Or how does my friend who used a poem to create a huge piece of pottery for the UNC, um, the UNC International Study Center or something? But how do my words show up on clay or inside of clay? And how do we paint this and stretch those connections inside of choreography? So this is a, a piece of ancestral money uh, inside of a basket and an urn and uh, a tobacco leaf, a North Carolina tobacco leaf. That's also very much symbolic and metaphoric of the currency for white dresses. Uh, 
the photo next to it is uh, inside of Nina Simone's um, birthplace in Tryon, inside of the old home place. That's a whole other project. But this was a hole in a wall that was like screaming for me to come listen. Um, so it's just not about the white dress, but it's where the white dress has been and, and what kind of residency it takes up. The photographs of the young girls with ice cream cones, you know, dressed in there, what looks like probably after Sunday school or after church, is very, very reminiscent of my own growing up in a rural segregated South in the 50s and 60s. Uh, and that screen next to it is a screen inside of Nina Simone's kitchen in, in that old house. And what are the veils, what are, what are the pieces that we continue to peep through for the telling and for the untelling sometimes? Uh, this is our granddaughter, Fiona, uh, situated next to my eldest daughter's tombstone, Imani. And in telling these stories, I start from a place of beginning and ending that Fiona is the future looking ahead, and Imani being my firstborn, my first North Star, very much is configured inside of this, this construction of white dresses. Um, would you like to read, or would yeah. you like to play the video? So, I, all of these random, I wanted to just share random primary sources that I use in the building of my work. Um, there are like thousand, thousand more photographs because I'm always looking for found photographs, photographs in, inside of our, our family. In addition to documents, I have Caswell Holt's bill of sales uh, that I would like to at some point uh, make it a part of a white dress. Would like for his bill of sales to be stamped on on a white dress or uh, Imani's tombstone, you know, her name. and. So how, how do we reconstruct the white dress? So this next video, you want me to show the video now? Yeah, if you, um, if you go back one, so, I can click into it. No, oh, I'm uh -oh. sorry. You've I revealed the process here. Oh. Oops. Okay. Leave it to me to screw it up. So, um, sure. So, oh, she got Yep, it. we got it. No big deal. So this video we're going to look at, um, oh, my brother is... Again, uh, oh. using this poem that I want to talk about the absence of primary and secondary sources. This poem was commissioned as a part of a project called Poetry of Lamentation during all of the um, murders that were happening in the 2000s, um, African American men and women at the hands of, of police. So for the project, I was told that within 48 hours I would receive a, a, a link to a TV station or a newspaper about someone who had just been murdered. And I was thinking, I'm waiting for somebody to die to do an art project. And I was. Um, because the project, because all of the deaths, the poems that were written before me had occurred within 48 hours of the assignment. When I received my link, it was a three second bite that just literally said, African-American male shot on route 240, more news tonight on the six o'clock news. That was it. No name, uh, some unknown city to me in, in, uh, in Michigan. So the absence of, of, I talk about containers and the containers that we are constantly lifting into and pulling out and putting back in. But this, this absence, when absence becomes a container itself, the absence of information becoming a secondary material. So this is a piece of Oh My Brother for this unnamed brother who represents metaphoric of all the men. the 
bullet inside my mouth that cannot stop convulsing with pain. I will learn to swallow the spasms in your screams. I am calling my brothers and my sisters to the ground beside this river where your blood is born, where your blood runs, until it is clear, until its red is spent, and it stands up like the wind and speaks into a light we cannot. I beat my chest, pierce my hands, run back and forth naked and rain, trying to swallow this red of a bullet that knew your name, cracked open your smile, stole your name. Oh my mother, I weep for all I do not know about you. I weep with the bullet that is lodged in my throat, whispering. Its own requiem. The red of the bullet cries out your name. The bullet whispers to me about the flowers that heard the sound. The bullet whispers to me about the sorcery of forgiveness. The bullet whispers to me about black flies stirring the ground. Save the sand inside your shoes. Oh, my mother, where is your mother, your father, who will help me scrape the dry blood that blocks the doorway of your heart? I want to be the water, the sweet oils that rub into the skin. I want to hold your bones steady so your mother can identify your face. Rub the soft I know we're all super into uh, in the moment here with Jackie's work, but so we have a little bit extra time for you all to speak together about how your work um, speaks to each other. Jackie, did you want to speak any more on, on your work before um, we get into the questions? No, I think I've said enough. I um, just want to go back to the white dress one more time just to talk about um, how I see it kind of as a shadow play almost with Monique. And uh, collaborations have always been uh, just one of the most fabulous experiences I've had with many different types of artists to be able to see your work translated into another language where it like becomes totally something you did not make and yet it's everything that you thought of making and that you did create. Um, so this project is going to be really multifaceted um, with lots of interactive experiences for public audiences, for women especially. Uh, and just, just thinking about the white dress as a landscape, the white dress as another emblem uh, and all of its many incarnations of, of the white uniform. You know, I think of servitude and, and women in, in white starch collars and women in laundries and women who take care of the white dresses and wedding dresses and communal dresses and altar dresses. So uh, I'll, I'll stop there, but we're going to be using a lot of real fabrics, both um, antiquated and not so an antiquated, uh, a very modern wedding dress that was given to us by Monique's sister. So thank you for uh, this possibility. Thank you so much, Jackie. Um, thank you to all the artists for sharing so much about your work and your process and these beautiful images. Um, again, this exhibition is up right now and you can see the video for um, Communion of the White Dresses as well. Um, so I would like to ask some questions to everybody here and you can pass off the mic 
you know, as you would like, whoever feels like answering. Um, obviously, there's a lot of connection within your work and the themes that you explore. And one of the big issues that we're all talking about here is community, um, especially collaboration and community engagement. So the McCall Center believes in the power of art to bring people together. We are now. Um, and we foster collaboration and community building. As you all think about your artistic practice, how has collaboration and community engagement influenced your creative process specifically? So whoever would like to speak upon that. We're all staring at Leo. Because <laughs> he's got, they got the mic. Well, I think I kind of spoke about this a little bit, but yeah, I would say that um, for me, um, community is what really provides the stories and the storytelling and what's so important um, to be able to kind of do a collaboration and, and get community involvement to be able to translate it into the artwork. And I, I think without the input from community engagement or collaboration, um, I don't know that I would be able to create the same way. So it's it really is something that um, motivates and, and, dr and drives the, my work. Yeah. You can see it so literally in that piece where you have the community sign. So, makes total sense. You have the mic again, Leo. <laughs> yeah, I think we, well, we are always collaborating between each other, but uh, we really appreciate working with other artists and communities. So, yeah, it's like a, something really where we always start from, you know, yeah, I think, I think community informs a lot our practice. Uh, for example, I, I believe that's one of the reasons we, uh, uh, we make lots of participatory installations. I think in one moment in COVID, uh, we said, wow, well, imagine if COVID remains like the way it is. Uh, I think we won't do any more work because we, we like people to respond. We like the physicality of installations and we like to interact uh, uh, with the visitors in our piece. Uh, I think we, our work uh, asks a lot uh, participation and collaboration. For example, besides the participatory installations that we do, uh, uh, we collaborate a lot with other artists. We have uh, films with uh, uh, Caitlin Horschman, for example, a KC uh, artist. Where, uh, where we did uh, Water Western because we, are, we realized the amount of fountains that Kansas City has so we could uh, uh, narrate uh, a Western story with all the fountains that KC has. So, and we have other collaborations with American artists, Brazilian artists, so uh, community and collaboration, I think, informs a lot of our work. Okay. Anyone over here? You don't have to. There's multiple questions, but if it calls to you. No? All right. I mean, I have one for you, I see. Right away. <laughs> so you mentioned exploring hybridity in your work. Could you elaborate on how your art challenges traditional binary thinking and what inspired this approach as we kind of see this issue of identity and hybridity throughout all of your works, but especially and most specifically with you? Yes. Um yeah, so I think where, where it comes from is, I, kn I know I spoke a little bit about this already, but being um, first generation on one side and my mother being from the US, my father came from Peru in his 40s. Um, and I think it was a very um, traumatic transition. Um, I think he you know, was experiencing racism for the first time, experiencing a lot of the things of this country that are difficult about this country um, for the first time. And so being raised by him was definitely being raised by someone who was very afraid. Um, and my sister looks a lot more Latin than I do. And so I think growing up, I was very affected by um, what people will say to me in a private circle versus what they'll say to her. And thinking about um, how bodies speak before people speak um, and what it means to not identify with one or the other, but inhabit this kind of like distinctly undefined space um, and I think investigating then like why are people so uncomfortable with a body that they can't categorize whether it's race whether it's gender um, and kind of diving into 
that response as being then this catalyst for breaking open this kind of categorical thinking that we um, just kind of perpetuate in, in our society. And so um, using that hybridity, not necessarily, I don't, I don't want my work to um, be talking about my life, but using that like symbol of hybridity as a way to then break things open and have um, more, um, I guess, broader conversations about those topics, whether it's um, I'm literally bringing materials together that are oppositional, or um, you know, bringing in a mythology that's not a dominant mythology that's kind of been um, quelled by colonialism, but bringing it to the like forefront of the conversation. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question. I think it does. <laughs> the duality between <laughs> the actual materials versus the concept both being hybrids. It's very fascinating. Thank you. Well, since we're over here, May, um, since you live in so many places and countries and cultures, how has this nomadic existence influenced your artistic exploration of identity and belonging? Um, very, very much so, <laughs> it did. Um, I think, uh, like, partially, as I said, my, my practice spans from very much like uh, individual self-indulgent practice to social art. And on, on, on one part, on this part, uh, I, I think in, in my case, my practice very much says about my life, or, or it is my, my life, like my practice is my life actually very, very, very much so. I don't, I don't differentiate uh, much. Um, and um, the, the question and concern on belonging and alienation and being the other and displacement and trying to find authenticity and meaning in, in the world, uh, whether it's just a location, a place, or, or um, ideology, or a person, or a home, or uh, whatever it is uh, that you want to hold on to something. When you constantly move around, it's very difficult. But at the same time, it's uh, there is something really delicious about it in terms of exploring your existence as a human being. Because like being being settled, uh, it's very easy. There's something very uh, fundamental. There's the place. You're settled. You have the place. You have your people. You have your community. You have your place. You have your history. Uh, when you constantly move around, uh, of course, when, when you're forced, it's a whole different thing. Um, and, and, and displacement, like in our families, and, and uh, in fact, a lot of like immediate family members and friends right now also, because of political reasons. Um, it's uh, the, this constant displacement and, and movement shakes something underneath your, your feet uh, a lot, of course. But at the same time, it makes you question uh, what belonging is, what that concept of home is. And uh, I don't want to go metaphysical and say it's in you, but it is in you. It is you. It is, it is I, and because in that I, it is my history, it is my memories, it is my loved ones, it's my uh, the, the narrative, the way my, my perception of life, everything that. I carry with me, we all do. Um, I, I think uh, for my practice it was a lot of, it brought a lot of positives um, and I um, question, still question those, those concepts a lot in my work. Thank you, May. Um, so I think those, those words of belonging and space um, and place bring us to another common theme of environment. So I would like to give the mic back to Dennis and Leo over here. And I have a question for you regarding environment, um, environmental urgency to be specific. How does your exploration of visible and invisible boundaries relate to the environmental themes within your work? Sorry, could you repeat? Of course. How does your exploration of visible and invisible boundaries relate to the environmental themes within your work? Yeah, I 
think our, our recent production is a way to uh, respond for this place, uh, this small village where we are living. Uh, like this, this video, Chic Chic, this is just a starting point because this Chic Chic, the name of this cactus, is the name that we choose for our organization. And there are many stories, many layers behind. I can tell few. It's like the the oldest name of the town, the small town was Chic Chic, but then they they do a biggest town and it was confusing, so they changed the name for for Igatu, with which in uh, Guarani language means the good water. Um, so in a way, it's like remember that old story, the old times where this Chic Chic after the mining period was the only available food. Uh, we really li like also research and investigate about, about food and this is uh, the shiki shiki they are burning because it's the way uh, you start the process of preparing this food which was very important for those families that stay there after, after the mining was over. There was just four families that stayed there. So all this history came from this, this community, these friends, and all the, the histories we are hearing. Like also this cactus, uh, this furry thing, it's the, um, the furry that the Asia floor. Uh, the hummingbirds, which there is a lot of hummingbirds, and they use this to do the nests. And, and also it's like, it, always point to the sunset so in a way like if you were lost they tell many stories that when people got lost they used this cactus to kind of locate so i don't know if i answer this qu the question <laughs> but he did but yeah i think uh, our work now is very based on our surrounding and our context and people that we meet and I think, for example, living in a small community in a national park as well, we have the sense of, you know, we are nature. So uh, there is no this, uh, you know, uh, this is uh, uh, environment and this is man, this is culture, this is nature. So I think when you live in a small community, things uh, start to, to merge easily. And for example, in one moment, we start to think about a lot about uh, sustainability, and this is one of the reasons we uh, uh, we are working uh, lately um, a lot with ceramic as with, with clay, because it's this ancestral uh, media, and uh, it, it merges with the soil. So uh, I think this this boundary is, is uh, they are I don't know imposed. Uh, and when you get out of the town, when you live, you know, in a rural place or in a, a place far from a, a really big city, you start to feel part of the nature. You, for example, when it rains, you stay quieter. Uh, when it's sunny, you go out and you can uh, go to a waterfall or walk. So I think this, these divisions are really connected to to the city and to science and to this way, to this way of thinking uh, uh, that we are living, you know, the, these ideas of progress and modernity. So if we just step back a little bit of this whole environment, we start, you know, to feel more connected to uh, nature and realize that we are nature. Thank you. I love that. We are nature. Actually, if you want to hand it over to Monique and Jackie. Um, so moving on to memory and tradition. Uh, your collaborative works involve reimagining tradition and symbolism. How do you see these traditions evolving in contemporary society? And what role do you think art plays in this transformation? When I think about the erosion of historical record as we're speaking, historical record is just continuing to erode and erupt. Um, I go back to thinking about primary sources again that I use in my own work as a writer. And, you know, 
I'm working with a coat, um, a found object, a found primary source or secondary source um, from the Civil War. The question begins, you know, like as a writer, how do I, how do I whisper agency into the seams of that coat? Or as a writer, how working with right now a project with the uh, the, Wilm the Wilmington massacre that's coming up, a big piece that I have to work with next in November. Like, how do I discern the smell of gunfire from that 1800s Wilmington insurrection? How do I discern it from the smell of a Klan cross burning in my neighbor's yard in the 60s? And I, I come from this place of thinking about this in a very visceral way of how we show up inside of our art. And I forgot totally what the question was. Um, <laughs> Uh, but I knew I was going to answer it. Yeah. Um, I don't think it matters anymore. What, we'll just keep listening me, to you speak forever. Tell me what the question was. <laughs> of course. Um, uh, your collaborative work imagines reimagining tradition and symbolism. How do you see these traditions evolving in contemporary society? And how does art? Um, yeah, so for us as artists, is how are we using this white dress again as a landscape to kind of, um, when I think of the maker of of the white, the constructor of white dresses. Like how are we unraveling seams? And how are we unraveling those seams of the white dress or being able to allow people to hear the, the secrets around the collar of a white dress or what's happening to the armpit of, of white dresses or those stained white dresses. Like our role as an artist is to kind of reimagine, reinterpret and um, recycle, I don't like that word, but to upcycle. Um, a new way of thinking about how we show up in histories and thinking about how histories are not very far removed from our present everydayness. So what is the everydayness, ordinariness of how we pick up art and make it accessible to the people that we, in, in this case for the white dress, the women who will talk about their stories inside of their memories of white dresses, if that makes sense. And Monique, if you want to answer that one, you can, or I can ask you as we move on from memory and tradition to a related uh, theme of cultural heritage and preservation. Um, your project incorporates generational, gen generational white dress culture. Um, would you like to add any more? I know Jackie's kind of spoken on it, but would you like to add more about how you envision this contributing to the preservation and uh, sharing of cultural stories in particular? Yeah, I think for me, um, the white dress, you know, as a little girl growing up is a symbol, you know, it, it represents so many different things. And I, I know in my practice in the past, I've created many paintings with this white dress, but it's almost taking away what is this white dress. It's not, it's almost as if it's not a white dress anymore. Because when you think about the color white, it's really all colors within that one white. So I think for, it's almost about not it being traditional. It's almost the opposite of that. Mm -hmm. and, and that's kind of where I'm excited about this collaboration to explore you know, the stories that are coming from, as Jackie talked about, the seams and you know, what does that mean? And so each, if you really look at the poem that she wrote, it's in the end of the day, it's really not about the white dress. It's about all these other things. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, you know, <laughs> When I think about the white dresses, I think a lot about violence. I think about paternalism. I, um, uh, I think about labor. Uh, I think about how, um, I mean, like, it's hard for me to even talk about this because like a thousand things are running through my head and my, and my mind just from growing up with this notion of white. And so like, this is my permission to myself to sully the white dress. Mm -hmm. to like get it as dirty as I can get it, to drag it through the fields, to punch holes in it, to take that wedding veil and take it to the forest and let whatever wants to eat it, live in it, live in it. And talking about transformation is helping people think about how we're recreating our own histories with every breath mm -hmm. and helping um, people who will witness, participate, and walk away, you know, just thinking about the things that we keep. I believe that what we keep keeps us. 
Um, and I also believe that there are many things that we keep that we sh probably should not keep. It. And what are the containers for how we dispel or uh, dismantle or disintegrate or uh, create something else out of that? I mean, I would like to burn the white dress. Oh. Um, you know, like when I, when I think about the violence of colonialism and the whiteness of it, um, and then just like a, you know, like the color white in so many different cultures and what it means in different cultures, you know, what it means in Condomble and and, and all of its cultures and it's celebratory over here and it's something else over here, and just loving that soup, and and yet the white dress can still, you know, I, I want to fly her like a flag, but very differently. Mm. Makes sense. Thank you. So I have more questions I could ask, um, but I neglected to tell the audience that we'd like to open it up to you all as well. If you have questions for the artists, you can raise your hand and we can bring you a microphone. No pressure or anything. Nobody? We need Oh, we do. We do have a question. Yeah. Oh, stuck. Oh, yes. So you went swimming in that photo. So that was all you getting out there. My goodness. <laughs> and it was cold. That's quite an experience. It's just a comment. <laughs> As someone who just said they do not like the cold. Right <laughs> now, yeah. truly suffering for your art. Thank you. Anyone else? And the gentleman over there, you have fire going on on those cacti. I didn't, un, I couldn't really hear everything you were saying, but there's symbolism in that. Can you comment on that? What was going on? Did you comment on it? Or did I miss it? I missed it. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's just that I didn't, the volume wasn't loud enough for me. I wasn't close enough to mm. Is there a, maybe a short re, uh, version of the symbolism of the fire on the cacti? I can imagine many things, and I, and I can let you, you know, imagination of many of the people Mm. 
many layers. Thank you. Does anybody else from the audience have a question for any of the artists? Oh. So my question is for Jackie. Um, I feel like some time ago I came across that video organically on the internet and uh, really enjoyed the poem and I just wanted to know when it was published or how, how old the video is. Okay. Okay. Interesting. And maybe the confusion on published, like not in a book, but I've seen it online and really enjoyed it. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much. Anyone else? 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 I'm curious because you said that you collect all this stuff that you work with and there are some like huge stunts. <laughs> so, you know, it's like a routine, an uh, everyday process or sometimes you just now I need to collect elements or do you carry like a bag? <laughs> How is it, you know? It's, uh, it's curiosity so about this process, this part of your uh, process. Yeah, I think, I think I've moved around. Oh, thank you. I've moved around a lot, and um, I'm maybe more of an introvert than my husband is. <laughs> um, and we have dogs, and so I walk the dogs three times a day or something. And for me, it's a really nice way to be in a place, because I, I see my community, and my community sees me, and we start to develop a relationship. Um, and I just kind of uh, like to see what is left on the ground. And so sometimes, um, I normally always, I've learned to like carry a bag with me because I'm always wanting something. <laughs> but it'll be like a shattered side mirror or um, it'll be like broken car glass from a car that's been broken into and that feels like this really quiet relic of like human violence, human time. Um, and then, so, so it's kind of like, I just kind of collect every time I'm out. Uh, but sometimes I won't have a bag and I'll see something like, uh, there was a moment in my neighborhood where there, something had happened, like a, like a wreck or something, and part of the sidewalk had been destroyed and was in all these pieces. And I was like, I just have to have that. <laughs> and so I went back um, with like a big bag and like got a lot of the pieces of the sidewalk because it's not just like, there's like rebar in it. And it was just really fascinating. But um, when I moved to Memphis, it's an 11 hour drive from Chapel Hill, which is where I went to grad school and where I was living. And, um, you know, the things that I brought with me were kind of crazy. Um, but I heard my father-in-law when we got to Memphis, he was on the phone with, um, I think actually my mom. And he was like, Essie brought this huge cinder block with her. And I, um, I told one of my friends that I went to grad school with that story because I thought it was so funny. And she was like, was it that really good one with the nail? Because I'd have brought that too. Um, so, Anyway, I do just kind of um, pick things up. I, I always have kind of done that. And my grandfather was a forester, and he picked things up and would. So I had this like huge collection of um, objects, like animal skulls or like a hummingbird's nest, like things that he had collected throughout his life that he gave to me before he died. And um, so, yeah, I might honestly. Great question. Anybody else in the audience have a question? Well, I think on that note, um, most of us start out as artists, as collectors, and picker-uppers of things that maybe we shouldn't as children, and then we hold on to them forever in our studios. Um, so as we move back to memory, I had a question for May about memory and tradition. Um, May, you mentioned that your visual narratives explore memory and selfhood. 
Can you explain how memory influences your artistic process and the narratives you create? Mm -hmm. uh, I think ma majority of my practice, at least, I mean, I have the, the research side and the documentary side, but uh, for my <coughs> video performances and the images stills that I choose, or Im you know, Im images narratives that I choose, uh, I, th they are very psychoanalytical, and it, it's uh, it's something that I have realized later. Uh, so uh, a lot of those um, designed images or performances or um, installations and some land art have their basis in in. Uh, memories, both individual memories, collective memories, and um, there are not some imaginary narratives that comes out of nowhere. They, they all have their roots, um, but of course uh, they, they come out uh, differently, but ve very much rooted. Um, some, some times like uh, Subconsciously, sometimes consciously. Thank you. Photo and video and <laughs> You might want to sing. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you all have been here for a little bit, uh, a couple weeks, and have settled in and gotten to know each other. Um, would any of you like to take this remaining 50 minutes we have um, to ask questions to each other or? Talk about anything that you maybe haven't covered that you're interested in exploring or just chatting about tonight. Anyone? No? We're all talked out. You have talked a lot. <laughs> and offered us a lot. All right. Well, I think on that note, um, thank you all again so much um, for sharing. Oh, we have a question. Oh, all right. About the, um, I'm circling back to the swimming in the cold water, <laughs> cold water. Um, because I get lost a lot in the ocean and I just forget and my family comes looking for me because they don't know where I am. But thinking of memory and projects and art, will you ever revisit that? Will you ever think about, will you ever remember that in a different way? Will you ever revisit that and try to remember it and bring it back up? And, you know, 10 years down the road, would it be different? You know, would your memory of it be different than your memory now? Yes. Well, that, I guess that one in particular, but um, all of them, really. Do you ever revisit them? Oh, definitely, yes. Okay. Well, uh... I can say actually, like even, even though I see uh, things that I create, like my props and you know sculptures and costumes, etc., they're very temporary. Like they they disappear afterwards. I always pray to I was talking about like make something permanent because it's almost always like very spontaneous. Uh, I'm making these props and then they go away. Uh, so in, in that terms, I always think, oh, I'm not a process-based artist, but I'm realizing. Which I'm very much so a process based artist, the way I do things, actually all of them, they are uh, every single one of them are my life stories and just making them and just uh, I was looking at showing them to you and getting nostalgic and, and, and melancholy because I I can I know like, which friend or family members is gonna tell and how we ate that thing that we did.
Lots of good questions and wonderful answers. Um, so in the coming weeks, as you all continue your residency and months, um, we'll be creating some fun programs and educational opportunities and more talks um, that these artists will be leading. So thank you for joining us tonight. And please come back to the McCall Center to experience more one-on-ones with these great artists. All right, and I give them all a hand. They're amazing. <laughs>